Well, Ricky is about nine years old. He's sitting perfectly still. He hasn't moved for ten minutes. He hasn't sat that still for about ten months. He didn't ever really take to his teachers at school, and they didn't really take to him either. But he's not at school now. He's sitting on some bright, fresh green grass, and he's holding something in his hand. But his attention is somewhere else. He's transfixed on the water in front of him. And his eye, his ears are straining to hear the soft, gentle voice of the man next to him. Okay now, just ease him in, Ricky. That's it. That's it. The tremor of excitement enters his grandfather's voice. Ricky adores everything about his papa. His old man's smell and his, his rough stubble. He's even got a T-shirt that says, I'd rather be fishing with my grandson. See, that's a picture of peace, isn't it? Fishing with your granddad. No one's in a rush. Maybe they'll catch some fish. Maybe they won't. They're just enjoying each other's company. And I hope there's going to be a lot of that this Christmas, maybe after the lunch is settled. Well, imagine if that picture, fishing with your granddad, imagine if that could describe all of your life. Peace within yourself and peace with each other, peace on the earth. See, friends, we were enjoy and designed to enjoy peace. But thousands of years of human history show that we can't achieve it as a race, can we? And if you're anything like me, even just a few decades will show that you can't achieve it even in your own life. Friends, we were made to enjoy it. But does anyone really have it? How on earth do we get it? Well, the one who designed us to enjoy peace, well, he tells us, and he tells us we can't earn it, we can't make it, but the Bible says it can, it can be ours if we're willing to accept it as a free, undeserved gift. Well, I'm going to pray, and then we'll jump into the Bible to see what the, what the Bible means by that. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for Christmas. We thank you for all that it means for us. We thank you that because you have sent a baby, grew into a man, a baby who was God the Son himself, the world is offered peace. By your Holy Spirit, may you speak to us about what you mean. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to read from the Bible now. As Bernard said, I'll be reading from uh, Luke chapter 2 and reading the account of Jesus' birth and some other things that happened. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar, Augustus, that the whole empire should be registered. This was the first registration that took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. So everyone went to be registered, each to his own town. Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and family line of David, to be registered along with Mary, who was engaged to him and was pregnant. While they were there, the time came for her to give birth, and then she gave birth to her firstborn son. And she wrapped him tightly in cloth and laid him in a manger, because there was no guest room available for them. In the same region, shepherds were staying out in the fields, keeping watch at night over their flock. Then an angel of the Lord stood beside them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Don't be afraid, for look, I proclaim to you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the city of David a Saviour was born for you, who is the Messiah, The Lord, this will be the sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped tightly in cloth and lying in a manger. Suddenly there was a multitude of the heavenly host with the angel praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and peace on earth to people he favours. When the angels had left them and returned to heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go straight to Bethlehem to see what's happened which the Lord has made known to us. 
They hurried off and found both Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. After seeing them, they reported the message that they were told about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary was treasuring up all these things in her heart and meditating on them. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they'd seen and heard, which were just as they'd been told. Well, it's dark and it's quiet. The sheep are calm as sheep can be. And then boom, or should I say whoosh, a cloud as bright as lightning. In a daze, the shepherds hear a voice. And it begins as angels always have to when they speak to people. It's okay, it's okay, don't be afraid. I've got good news for you. Verse 10 there, good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Guys, he's saying, there's a present waiting for you under the tree. A gift today from God to you. A child has been born. Or as the angel puts it, the child was born for you. The child is a gift for you. Now, the conversation doesn't actually happen like I'm going to tell it, as I'm sure the shepherds are actually dumbstruck as well as awestruck. And I'm going to put some words in the angel's mouth. So here we go. Now, you shepherds, says the angels, here are some clues that will tell you why I'm saying that the child is a gift for you. First clue, he's been born in the city of David. David. Does that ring any bells for you? Well, what answer might the shepherds be thinking? Hmm, David, David. Well, he was only the greatest king that our people's ever known, the one whose great, 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 great grandson uh, was going to rule over God's people forever. That's David. Right, says the angel. Next clue. He's a saviour. A saviour, thought the shepherds. Now, a king sometimes saved our people. But God's prophets, and even King, the King David himself, called God our only true saviour. Hmm. Well, next clue from the angel. He is the Messiah. The Messiah, they thought. That's God's chosen one, the anointed one, the one who's been promised for centuries. And won't the Messiah be the one to rule over God's people forever? and rule over all the nations of the world? You're saying the Messiah has been born today? He's the Messiah, says the angel, and the Lord. The Lord? But but that's our God's name. Who is this baby with God's name? Well, how does the actual uh, angel actually say it? Well, verse 11, Today in the city of David a Saviour was born for you who is the Messiah, the Lord. So you can see that the angel really did use all those titles for this tiny, scrunched-up, red-faced, newborn baby lying in a feeding trough, maybe a mile or so away. He's a king who's a gift for you, for you shepherds and for your people. The king who's greater than the greatest king you've ever had, the king who will save you, the king who will rule you, the king who will rule over all forever, the king who has the same name as God himself. And that's our second point. The king is a gift for you. Well, you can imagine that the shepherds are pretty surprised, aren't they? I mean, they're astonished that the angels appeared at all. They're astounded that the angels came to them. I mean, the laws of their own people, the Jews, don't allow shepherds, as they are, working with sheep and everything, um, to do much of their religious stuff. And yet God chose them to be the one to hear God's big news. Is it really true, though, all these things that the angel said? Well, it's a bit much for the shepherds to take in, isn't it? Well, the angel seems to think it's a bit much for them to take in, and so he gives them a sign to confirm what he said. What would be the best sign, do you think? A sign so that the shepherds can be sure but that what the angel said about the baby is true. Well, it's the baby himself. 
As I said, says the angel, he's a gift. So he'll be gift-wrapped and uh, packed snugly in a hamper. Or to put it more accurately, verse 12, you'll find a baby wrapped tightly in cloth and lying in a manger. Well, the baby's been born, here's what to look for. Of course, on any other night, when accommodation is scarce, like it is at the time, uh, if they stumbled across a baby in a feeding box, uh, that'd be nothing special. There's nothing special about the sign itself that hints that he's a great king. In fact, the sign itself seems to say the opposite, doesn't it? I think of all the grand titles that the baby's been given, and there he is, helpless, in a manger. It's a terrific gift, but he's wrapped in brown, plain paper. See, if they'd only seen the baby that night, but not what the angel, they'd not heard what the angel had said, they'd have no clue, would they? No clue about who he was and what he was going to be and what he was going to do. He'd just be a baby in a box. But this insignificant, everyday sign lets the shepherds be certain about what they've heard. And if they can be certain, then Theophilus can be certain. He's the book that, the, that Luke has originally written the book for. Um, he's the fellow. If he can be certain, then we can be certain too. Certain that the king is a gift for you. And he's a gift wrapped in brown paper. Now just before I go on to our next point, the gift of the brown paper, the gift in the brown paper packaging, it doesn't really give us much of a clue that who the king is, but this humble wrapping does give us a clue about what kind of king he'll be and what kind of mission he's come to do. It's a mission of peace. But we'll hear more about that in our next point. When you're choosing gifts for people, there's two types of people that you really got to think hard about. There's the practical type. Don't buy them something beautiful. Get them something functional. A tool or a sensible piece of clothing or an appliance. Not a useless appliance like an asparagus steamer or a banana slicer. They really exist. Um, buy something that they can honestly say about, oh, that'll come in really handy. And then there's the beautiful type of person. Buy them something like flowers or a coffee table book. If you buy them something practical, they'll take it that you think that they should be more practical, and that won't go down at all well. But uh, if it, it won't, if you get it wrong, it won't really matter too much. If they see that you mean well, then it'll be okay. Well, God doesn't just mean well when he chooses a gift for us. He knows that we need something very practical, even if we don't know it ourselves. He chooses the most practical gift for us, but also the most beautiful. And as the story of this king unfolds, we see that God's gift to us is also the most costly. An unimaginable cost for the father, the giver, and the son who is the gift. But in what way is God's gift to us practical? What is this gift that God gives us? What does it do for us? Well, I think we'll find the answer in what the shepherds hear next. What does the gift good do for us? Friends, if we will have him, the king God's gift brings us peace with God. The thing we most need, the gift brings us peace. So back to the story. And now a multitude of angels join the original bloke and lift their voices to God, praising and singing, glory to God in the highest heaven and peace on earth to people he favours. Glory to God in the highest. Friends, that's the ultimate purpose of life, that God, the giver of life, would be seen for who he is and praised for who he is. That's why we exist, you and me. But friends, there's also a very big problem here, and it's us. In our natural state, praising God, enjoying God is the very last thing on our minds. 
Instead, we're actually at war with him. We're hostile towards him. We've been made to enjoy him, but we don't want anything to do with him. And we certainly don't like the idea that he owns us because he made us. We should be at peace with him, but instead we're enemies. But he wants peace with the earth, not war. And that's what the gift is for. This beautiful and practical gift of a king for us. He he is sent by God to make peace, to do everything that's needed to restore peace between God and mankind, to end that hostility, to restore friendship so they can enjoy each other's company. Well, like fishing with granddad. But in this case, it'd actually be fishing with dad himself. But listen again to what the angels say. Who is the peace for? And peace on earth to people he favours. The peace God offers is only for those he favours. Only for those he favours. Well, who on earth is that? Who on earth does God favour? Who warms his heart? Who does this peace speak to? Who or who does he speak this peace to? Who on earth has God's approval? Well, friends, that is the most important person question you will hear ever in your life. Who on earth has God's approval? Well, it's the most important question, but the answer is very simple, and it all comes down to this. Have you responded to the gift that God's offered you? His son, your king, how have you responded? Have you received the gift or have you refused it? Have you received your king or have you snubbed him? Have you put out your hand empty to receive his gift? If you have, then you do have his favour. You do have his approval. You do have peace with God. But, friends... Peace with God comes only in him, only through the gift of God's Son. So friends, after all this, I want to leave you with a question. Will you accept your king, God's gift to you, and the peace that comes through him? There's a few different people I'm thinking of when I ask that question. I've got those people in mind. I don't know who you are. But the first person I'm thinking of is someone who knows that they have not accepted the gift of God's Son and the peace that comes through him. You don't feel like you need a king. You don't want a king. You have no plans to give your king your life over to that king. You don't need the peace he brings. You've been doing quite fine without it. Perhaps you don't even believe there is a king. Well, if that's you, can I ask you this question? Where will you find your peace? Where are you going to find that peace if you won't accept it from God? Well, the second person I'm thinking of uh, is confident uh, that they've accepted the king. You call yourself a Christian. Uh, You believe you're basically a good person. Other people respect you. They think you're a good person. <clears throat> you imagine, or you at least hope, that God thinks you're a good person. You hope that God, you have God's approval. Well, if that's you, can I ask you these questions? Are you absolutely sure that you have peace with God? Are you banking everything on you being a good person? Well, then why bother about God's gift to you at all? Did God really need to send his son to die for you? It seems like you've already sorted that out. My question to you is, are you absolutely sure that you have peace with him? And there's two more people I'm thinking about. Now, one's the person who would love to accept the gift and that peace, but you don't think you deserve it. 
Well, to you, I would, I would, for you, I'd love you to listen to what I will say to the person, what the Bible says to the person who have it, has accepted the gift. And that's the last person. You've seen your need for a king to save you, to rule you, to protect you. You've accepted your king, God's gift to you. So when the angel said to the shepherds, peace on earth, to the people he favours, that's you. They were talking about you. You've received the king and so you have peace with God. But can I encourage you to keep reminding yourself of that peace? See, at that first Christmas, God gave his son to bring you peace. And peace with God will transform how you think about all areas of your life. The way you think about God, the way you think about each other, the way you think about yourself and think about life around you. Why? Why does it transform all those things? Because God is no longer angry with you, my friend. My friends, whoever you are here, the war is over. You're no longer enemies like you once were. Your king, God's gift to you, has already done everything that's needed to bring peace between you and God. You're no longer under his just judgment. You're free. You're free to enjoy him like you were designed to do. You're free to fulfill your purpose. And my friend, this peace is not just a ceasefire. It's the ongoing favour, the approval, the blessing, the affection of your loving father. Fishing with your granddad, but now fishing with your dad. And remember, you didn't earn it. You can't earn it. It came through a gift, remember. The very practical and beautiful Christmas gift of Jesus, your King. I'm going to pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for that wonderful gift that you have given us at Christmas. Your own dear Son, at great cost to yourself and for our peace. We pray by your Holy Spirit that you would apply the things that you've said to us in your Bible today to our hearts, that we might know our King and know his peace. We pray in his precious name. Amen.